of the Mason Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 157, covering the week of February 11th through February 15th, 2019. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute. And, of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. You can support the Abbeville Institute by going to www.abbevilleinstitute. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. At the top of the page, you'll see a button that says Support. You click on that, and you've got uh, donor options. And you can donate to the Institute monthly or annually or just a one-time donation. Lots of different options. Uh, you can also support the Institute by buying our Abbeville Institute apparel under that same uh, button that says support. You click on the shop button and you've got all of our Abbeville Institute gear. You've got shirts, hats, fleece, uh, all kinds of cool things. So go out there and get your Abbeville Institute apparel. Uh, also, uh, don't forget to download our free mobile app. Just go to your favorite app store, whether it's Google Play, iTunes, whatever the case may be, and get our app. Again, free of charge, and that will uh, get you the Abbeville Institute on the go where you can listen to this podcast, all of our lectures. We've got over 200 lectures available um, free of charge on the app. So go out and do that. And, of course, gives you a link to the uh, website as well through the mobile app. So it's a, it's a great tool, free of charge, doesn't cost you a dime to do this. And, of course, if you do support the Institute through your generous contribution, which is tax deductible to the full extent of the law, you do help keep these things going, the website, the podcast, the app, all of our programs, all the things we do. We've had a great experience with our uh, online Jefferson seminars, which are also free of charge. Uh, we've been doing these the last three weeks. The last one comes up February 19th, Tuesday, February 19th. I will be hosting the last of the four-part series on Albert Taylor Bledsoe's Is Jefferson a, a Trader? Uh, I'm sorry, is Jefferson? Is Davis, a Jefferson Davis a Trader? Excuse me. Uh, so you've got, um, I mean, of course, the people nowadays would consider Jefferson to be a traitor in the American War for Independence, but that's another story in and of itself. Uh, so uh, we've got a lot of great stuff, and we do exist on your generous contributions alone, so help support the Institute and in everything we do. All right, all that said, let's talk about the week that was at the Institute, and of course, this was Abraham Lincoln's birthday week, so we uh, we didn't publish anything on Lincoln, but it all has to do with Lincoln, you see. Um, and so if you if you understand the transformation from a Jeffersonian America, as Dr. Livingston likes to point out, to a Lincolnian America, it's all there in the material we were talking about this week. Everything is there. So um, I want to start with the piece that Clyde Wilson wrote uh, for Tuesday. And this is a book review that was written back in the 80s. It's on John Lukash's Remembered Past. And if you've never read that book, it is a study of history. And what's interesting, uh, Clyde sent me an email after we published it, and he said, I have a story about that. Um, apparently, that review was written for modern age back in the 80s, and they buried it because they didn't want to publish it. And this goes back into the fact that there were a number of Southerners writing in the uh, 70s, 80s, of course, going back into the 60s with people like Richard Weaver, but men like Mel Bradford, of course, and Clyde and uh, Tom Landis and others, Tom Fleming, and who were very productive. Uh, but they were being ostracized by the, by the right, the neocon, the neocon cons, which I'm going to get into in a minute. These, these supposed conservatives who are now controlling the establishment uh, apparatus of Conservative Inc., we're blacklisting these Southerners because they didn't agree with them. They didn't think that uh, they were writing anything valuable. And the primary reason is because they were critical of Abraham Lincoln. And if you go back and look at what happened with Mel Bradford, when Ronald Reagan was elected president, Mel Bradford was going to be given a position, a very prestigious position in the general government. He was opposed by Bill Bennett, and then Reagan withdrew the nomination and that started the neoconservative takeover of Conservative Inc. If Bradford was able to be put in that position, you would have seen an entirely different Conservative Inc. today. Entirely different. And we see what happens with Conservative Inc. with some of the things that have gone on the past couple of weeks, which we're going to talk about. 
and how that relates to the South. So first and foremost, Clyde writes a wonderful review of this book, which is The Remembered Past. Now, Lukash has the best definition of history. And if you ever, for, for all of us, were able to take Clyde Wilson in graduate school, um, in his seminars, one of the things he would do is come in with a stack of papers or note cards, and he would just read, start reading off definitions of history. Um, because understanding what history is, is an important part of understanding what a historian does. And we've got this very fashionable trend now that David Blight has now made a career out of at Yale called Memory Studies. Well, I don't know if David Blight ever read John Lukacs. I highly doubt it. But uh, basically, history is the remembered past. This is what the title in implies. It's, it's everything that humans can remember. And so Blight now calls this field that he focuses on memory studies. It's just so stupid when you think about it. All of history is memory studies. It's always been that way, but now we have a field that David Blight has pioneered. It's memory studies, and it's fashionable, and it's, it's acceptable. And so how we remember our past is important. No kidding. So what we've got now in the 21st century is remembered past that's dominated by a Lincolnian vision of America. And that's the only acceptable remembered past. You see, what Blight does in his little book, Race and Reunion, is say that there's, well, there's another remembered past. It's this leftist remembered past. And so we should, and, and driven, uh, his, his main focus, and a, one valuable part of the book is to go into how the Southern black community remembered the past. I think that's a, that's a valuable addition to uh, the remembered past. And so that's that's a good part. But... He also says that that's the only remembered past that matters, essentially. The, the, other, the, the other remembered past, how other people remembered the South, is incorrect. It's incorrect. Essentially, what he's doing is saying what we do here at the Institute and how we remember the past is incorrect. That's, that's incorrect. It didn't happen that way. The way that this community remembered the past is how things happened. Could it be both? Certainly. Uh, because memory is a tricky thing. But not just that. It was seen as acceptable for Southerners to have a remembered past for a long period of time. That was until essentially the last half of the 20th century. Now, there are always people that oppose this view of the remembered past. I mean, even after, right after the war. I mean, uh, this was not something that was, uh, that was um, unheard of for Northerners in particular to remember the past differently than Southerners. And what we had, and Southerners were talking about it in the late 19th and early 20th century, what we had was an opposition to this New England version of American history. And so Southerners were trying to push back against that, saying, no, 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 that's not the real past. That's your version of the past. Our version of the past is this. And the evidence, I mean, take, for example, the Constitution. The evidence for a decentralized Jeffersonian vision of America is all there it's just that other people choose to remember it differently. But the evidence is all there. So the remembered past, again, is a fickle thing. How do you choose to remember the past comes into play. There is a truth. I mean, this is not to say that we're all mere sophists and everything is relative. There is a truth, and I think that you can find that. And as you look through it, um, for example, in How I Remember the New South, C. Van Woodward dominated that. Now, our summer school coming up this year in July is going to be on the New South. So you're going to want to attend. It's going to be a great, great, great conference. That is going to be our next conference. We haven't announced that yet, but it's going to be our next conference. Uh, we didn't do anything here in um, February like we normally do uh, because of some Jefferson seminars and some other things that we were doing. Uh, but we, our next major conference will be the summer school. Uh, so be looking out for that. It's going to be on the New South and, and uh, a little bit of Reconstruction. Um, and we've got these other, just an aside, we've got these other, this other project we're working on. Uh, these um, It's going to really change some things in terms of education. Uh, so look out for that. Be on the lookout for that, too, because that's going to be something interesting uh, that the Institute is doing. That is going to uh, broaden our reach. Uh, and these online Jefferson seminars are intended to be uh, conference-style 
material that you can get free of charge, and uh, we get uh, hundreds and hundreds of people watching these. So it's, it's taken the place of a conference in some ways. That said, uh, how C. Van Woodward remembered the past is that we had these uh, bur- the, the, the business-interested Southerners um, were not very Jeffersonian, and so they were pushing a different agenda, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, that's, that's also incorrect. If you look at the oratory in the New South, it was still very Jeffersonian. Even among the New South proponents, it was still very Jeffersonian. Uh, Henry Grady, for example, spoke a lot of the Old South in his promotion of the New. But these, this idea of memory and how we remember the past, how Americans remember the past, how, quote-unquote, conservatives remember the past, has been dominated now by the neoconservatives for the last 30 years. Since the 1980 takeover, 1981 takeover of Conservative Inc., with the ouster of, or the removal of, uh, of this, of withdrawal of the nomination of Mel Bradford uh, by, by uh, uh, Ronald Reagan because of his opposition to Abraham Lincoln. That's essentially what happened there. I mean, it was discovered that Bradford was critical of Lincoln and the neoconservatives went nuts, and so he was out. So, what we live in now, really, and, and this is where uh, this book, The Remembered Past, is interesting and, and important for understanding our study of history. What we live in now is a Lincolnian remembered past. And it's the Lincolnian vision of equality and the American founding. It goes back to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. So you might have think we didn't focus on Lincoln, but we did, because the piece on Wednesday, uh, Boyd Cathy's The Idea of Equality in America, hammers this neoconservative approach to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. You see, even Gary Wills, who wrote the the most widely read study on the Gettysburg Address, said it very accurately. Lincoln revolutionized the revolution. He basically fabricated history when he gave the Gettysburg Address. Um, because till that point, Nobody thought of the American War for Independence that way. Lincoln was very good at making things up. In his first inaugural address, he made a great political discovery that the Union was indissoluble, that the Union was, uh, was, that the American nation predated the states. This is the same thing that, of course, uh, James Wilson and uh, John Marshall and Daniel Webster had been saying since... uh, since the early 19th, uh, Joseph Story, since the early 19th century. In Wilson's case, since the late 18th century. In fact, as we've already talked about on this podcast, Wilson uh, was trying his best to fabricate, to come up with fake news, to fabricate a different version of the Declaration, even in his own time, because he made his own copy of the Declaration. Well, this was one that was discovered uh, by some researchers in Britain, and it's the Wilson broadside, and it's, uh, it's, it's not accurate. It's not accurate. Of course, Wilson was trying to say even in the 1780s, yeah, we've got the, the Union predated the states. When the nation predated the states, the states are a creation uh, of, uh, of the American War for Independence. So we didn't have those before. We didn't, we didn't have this stuff. Well, I mean, it is right. The states were created by the American War for Independence in terms of a codification of that. But they are already there. They already existed. Everyone knew that, except James Wilson. And so that version of America, though, Lincoln then codified that in the Gettysburg Address. And then everyone focused on the Declaration and this proposition that all men are created equal as the foundation of American government. And I was reading again, going back and reading Thomas Byard. If you don't know who Thomas Byard is, Thomas Byard was a U.S. senator, ambassador for Great Britain, secretary of state. Um, He was also arrested during the war for opposition to the Lincoln administration. I mean, here is a high-ranking American diplomat after the war, a U.S. senator after the war, a son of a senator, a direct descendant of a signer of the Constitution, right? Uh, This is an important guy. The Bayard family is one of the most important American families that nobody knows anything about. Uh, And Bayard, during Reconstruction, was pointing out the poison pill that uh, the uh, the United States, everyone in the United States was swallowing by accepting Reconstruction 
because he said, look, the things we're doing to the South now will turn on the North later. What we are doing is going to destroy the United States. It's going to destroy the Union. These are all done in the name of whatever political cause you want, whatever social justice uh, cause you want to, to have. What we're doing in the South is going to destroy the Union. And can he not, has he not been proven correct? Has he not been proven correct? But you see, the neoconservatives now have made a cottage industry out of promoting Reconstruction um, and out of promoting the radical Republican position. One of the last times I was on a major conservative, quote-unquote conservative, television network um, in 2000, 2012, I was invited on uh, sight unseen to go talk about American history. And as I had appeared on this program before, so I thought, okay, it'll be fine. Well, I go up there, and, and um, I get hit with, so the Republicans really are the good guys because of Reconstruction. And, of course, I did say that, you know, look, the, the, the radical Republicans certainly were this, this, and this. Uh, but I did make a point that that's not necessarily the entire Republican Party or that these people weren't considered conservative at the time. And I was never invited back on the show again because I didn't toe the neoconservative line, you see. And uh, but that's that's the problem. I mean, this is the Forest Neighbors from oligarchy to republicanism. This this new book that came out not long ago, and I heard Forest Neighbors all over the place for a time, talking about this version. I mean, Eric Foner might as well have written these things. And of course, Karl Rove has come out and said that Eric Foner is one of his favorite historians. You see, this is the neoconservative takeover. What it comes down to is that the Republicans controlled Reconstruction. Republicans are always right. Republican. It's the Republican Party. That's more important. It's R versus D. This is what you see, and this is when we get into the Northrum, the Ralph Northrum thing. This is this is evident in that. So all of this said leads up to what happened with Ralph Nor Ralph Northrum uh, here in Virginia in the last couple of weeks. So what we have is the idea of equality, the neoconservative takeover, this idea of equality, the Lincolnian version of America. It's taking over. Okay, so we have that now. It's, it's become paramount. The Republicans consistently push Lincoln's version of American history and then promote Reconstruction and the radical Republican agenda, which was the recreation of America, the transformation of America. Okay, so we have that in all facets. It wasn't just social transformation, uh, but there was also economic transformation, diplomatic transformation, military transformation, all those things took place because of the Republican Party. We live, as Kerry Roberts, and I've said this before, I said the last summer school, we live in New England's version of America. We live in it today. We've had New England history. We've had New England versions of government, society, economics. It's all there. We live in New England now. And people hate it. They hate it. New Englanders don't even want to be there. That's why they moved to the South, but yet they always bring New England with them. So this is important to understand where we are today, this idea of equality and how the neoconservatives have distorted American history. We don't really have a real memory of the founding or of the South because of it, not in the 21st century, because we've adopted this Lincolnian version. And so how we're considered uh, at the Institute you know, uh, fringe or radical for saying that, you know, wait a second, maybe there's something valuable in the Southern tradition. Maybe John C. Calhoun, there's something valuable about John C. Calhoun. Uh, maybe these Confederate soldiers weren't traitors. Uh, maybe there was something to that. Now, of course, that's seen as, uh, well, that's heresy now. You're, you're going against Lincolnian America. You can't say that. Maybe there was, maybe this, this updated version of Reconstruction that it was, that was good, maybe that's not necessarily true. Maybe there were some bad things going on there. Oh, no, no, no. You can't say that. Uh, because that's, that's heresy. It's, it's going against the Republican version, the New England version of American history. We've all just adopted it. You know, people don't even realize it's happened. But it's happened. So when you look at what happened with Ralph Northam, if you don't know, of course, Ralph Northam went on uh, the radio and openly supported infanticide. Right? There was a law before Virginia where 
uh, even after birth, you could uh, perform an abortion after birth. And so this caused a stir, as Houston Middleton, Middleton pointed out in our piece on Monday. He said, these are strange times. This caused a stir. There were conservatives. Oh, my gosh. I mean, this, is, this really is horrible. We wouldn't even do that to puppies or cats, kittens. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do it. And in fact, I, I, I don't know, but I believe it's against the law to do that <laughs> in, in, uh, in many states. But yet, children, that's okay. Human children, fine. Puppies, kittens, no. So where are our priorities? So there was an outrage over this. I mean, uh, people were rightly offended by this. But no one called for Northam to resign. No one said, you know what? That's murder. The governor of Virginia just openly advocated murder. But that's okay. It's a political question. This is all political, you see. It's okay. It's just a political debate. No one said anything about it. Now, just a couple of days later, a yearbook photo surfaces from 35 years ago where Northrum had uh, either w- either way was wearing insensitive attire. And, of course, as as we've talked about on this uh, this uh, this podcast before, I mean, you've got. You've got now entire divisions of colleges and universities dedicated to ensuring that people don't wear the wrong Halloween costume. So we've had insensitive attire now. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, we had several other members of that particular uh, administration come out and say they did the same thing. And then the, the Republican uh, uh, leader of the House, well, he was the guy that did the yearbook. And so we, now we had this whole outrage over some Halloween costumes. Yet the... Bill in question earlier. No one said anything about that, but now Northam has to resign. And, of course, he's running around the state now saying he's going to do all these things. One of them is supposedly going to be trying to take down every single Confederate statue in the state of Virginia. That's going to solve all the problems of Virginia, right? We're just going to go out there. We're going to take down all these statues because that will show that I'm really not a racist. So, I mean, where do you even unpack all of this? It's just so stupid and silly. In fact, Barbara Martha, who's an African-American, wrote a piece on Thursday saying, why are you letting them push our buttons? I mean, this is just ridiculous. It's ridiculous what's going on here. She says that, yeah, I can understand people be offended by blackface. I get it. I can also understand why people, white people be offended by the Three Stooges because they're portrayed as a bunch of idiots, too. So what do we do? Uh, is this not a distraction? Is it not a distraction from real issues? And what's interesting is the African-American community of Virginia were not the ones that were as outraged. Okay, well, yeah, it's bad. I mean, you did some bad things, but we still support you. But not the neoconservatives and not, of course, some people on the left who called for his immediate resignation after this came out. Um, So are people even allowed to make mistakes anymore? Um, it, because of our memory of the past, no, they're not. What we're going to have now is people going around and scoping out yearbooks and uh, finding some letter from second grade or something like that that they wrote that had something insensitive in it. I mean, this is what's going to happen in America in the 21st century. And it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Um, and I love Barbara Marthel's piece because now, if you don't know, she she spends a lot of time... Uh, she gets in a lot of trouble with uh, with people because what she tries to do is say, look, uh, we, what, where's the common ground? Uh, when I say gets in a lot of trouble, um, a lot of people don't like her message because she tries to find common ground between white and black Southerners, which is, I mean, amazing that that would get that would people would not like that very much. Um, but she she's not opposed to the Confederacy at all. Um, she runs around talking about uh, free property, uh, free black owners, property owners in the South. She she. She's uh, very much in, uh, promoting this, um, and she says what she believes, and that makes a lot of people uncomfortable on both sides at times. Um, so uh, this is uh, she. She's great for that, and uh, she's a big supporter of the institute. We've had her speak at our events, um, and so she she loves the South. She loves being from the South, and she loves telling stories about the South. That make people uncomfortable, and in this particular case, she's saying, "Why is it? The, why is it in the African American community we're letting anybody distract from real issues? This is a distraction. Tearing down statues isn't going to do anything." 
not going to solve any problems. She says the only way it's going to do this is for people to become better educated. Um, but, I mean, at that point, you know, in, in even that version of education, if we've got the Lincolnian version, well, then we're in trouble. But you see, it hasn't always been this way. The piece on Friday, Confederate Television, I think, is that the title of it? Let me, let me look here while we're on here. Confederate Television. Uh, yeah, pro-Confederate Television. Jeff Wolverton wrote this piece. Back in the 50s and 60s, you had, it was okay to be pro-Confederate. You had Johnny Yuma. Uh, you had some of these. Uh, one of the programs I had never heard of before. Um, it was uh, the um, uh, Yancey Derringer. I'd never heard of this show. Uh, but it's, it's, it's amazing. Mosby Raiders, we talked about that not long ago. Uh, but this, uh, this Yancey Derringer, this, these are interesting shows. Um, first of all, he has a sidekick, an, uh, an American Indian sidekick, um, who is just as pro-Southern and pro-Confederate as Yancey Derringer. Um, and so you've got all kinds of politically incorrect things going on here. Uh, but this is how Americans remembered the past for generations. Confederate soldiers were good and honorable people. Um, you know, maybe an outlaw at times here and there. You know, Jesse James was kind of had kind of this uh, cult following to him because he's he's doing something for the people. Um, so it, you had a complexity there. Yeah, I mean, there were things that were not good about these people, but there was also something noble about these people in a way too. And Johnny Yuma was this Confederate soldier. He was just trying to be a good man, to get away from the war. And, of course, you had Yankees that were the problem. You Yankees were portrayed as the problem. Now, I remember you know, Thomas Fleming, not Tom Fleming from Rockford, but Thomas Fleming from uh, the, the author, the uh, uh, prize-winning author, um, wrote a book not long ago on the war, before he died, where he was very critical of the abolitionists. And it was his last book, and I think he kind of waited to the end of his life to do this. Uh, because he understood what was going to happen. He was critical of the abolitionists in bringing about the war. And he was ripped apart for this. How dare he? I haven't seen these arguments since the 1850s. Well, I mean, what's happening now with the other side is that they're regurgitating arguments. I, I can say the same thing. When you have uh, Matthew Carp portraying John C. Calhoun from an 1850s argument. I mean, wh <laughs> that's all we're doing uh, for for this new version of American history is going back and reading the slave power theorists and saying, well, this is American history. This is the correct version. Or I haven't seen this version of Reconstruction from Forest Neighbors since the 1860s. Yeah. I mean, this is what we're doing now, right? So we, it, can, it can cut both ways. So which past do we choose to remember? Is it the Johnny Yuma past? Or the Yancey Derringer past? Or the Mel Bradford past? Or the Clyde Wilson past? Or is it the Forest Neighbors, or Bill Bennett, or, Bill, or David Blight, or Eric Foner? All those people together. And this is where Houston Middleton hit the nail on the head. He said, you know, what are we doing here? We live in strange times. Interesting times, he called it. We live in interesting times. And while people might say, well, Northam's getting his comeuppance for doing the same thing during the campaign when he called his opponent, constantly called his opponent racist. And I think this is why. These, this, these photos surfaced because somebody said, hey, look, this guy's a hypocrite. Should have come out during the campaign. Um, but, and that would have ruined Northam. Would have ruined him. But he's not going to resign. He shouldn't resign over that. Uh, the other thing where he's talking about, he should resign over that, over, over the, the comments on the radio. Uh, but 35 years ago, I mean, people change. And uh, that, that's just... It's silly to, to call for a resignation over a 35-year-old photo. Now, if you'd done something horrible, I mean, committed murder or something, that's something else. Um, but he, it was, this is the Kavanaugh situation where the guy was out drinking beer too much as a high school student. Of course, that well, we, we can't have a Supreme Court justice doing that. And, of course, now he's got you know the images of Kavanaugh with the beer cans and the hat and all these other kind of things. There were other reasons to oppose Justice Kavanaugh besides that. But this is where we are, superficial stupidity. And it has to do with the idea of equality, and it has to do with the Lincolnian version of America, and this neocon con, and what America is, and what America was, and how the left and the right, the neoconservative right, are working in concert to destroy a Jeffersonian understanding of America. Now, they would say they are Jeffersonian because 
Lincoln's version of American history was Jeffersonian, supposedly, because it's supposedly uh, in, in line with the Declaration, where you can go back and say, no, 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 not even Jefferson would have agreed with Lincoln's version of the Declaration. It's clear. He said it. Jefferson himself would not have agreed with Abraham Lincoln. Of course, Jefferson's descendants also fought for the Confederacy, so uh, there's that, too. But... Um, this is why the remembered past is so important, why having an understanding of history, why this book, John Lukash, Remember, Remembered Past, um, is so important uh, for, for an understanding of what a historian does, how you have to have an imagination. As Clyde even says, you know, most historians don't have the imagination, the imagination to do the job because it takes some imagination to be a historian. And they just don't have it. They're too ideologically driven. And they don't seek to understand. They seek to indoctrinate. And that is the real problem with American history in the 21st century. There are complexities. History is a complex thing. History is not something that's just black or white. As another uh, Clyde Wilson student said, it's shades of gray. And so if we have that understanding of the American past, of the remembered past, well then... History becomes something valuable and worthwhile. The Southern tradition becomes valuable and worthwhile because even though uh, it has some thorns, the South was, and in many ways, really is still America. This is what, the, this is what Donald Trump tapped into during his campaign. Uh, this uh, is what Richard Nixon was able to do in the 70s. Uh, that South really is America. Still is. It's very slim. Slim hanging on by a thread now, America, but it's still there. Um, and so this is where that remembered past is so important and what the Southern tradition teaches us about the past, this Jeffersonian version of America. It's still there. It's still, it's still valuable and why we exist at the Abbey Bill Institute. Until next time, good day. Good day.